Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Lunch and Learn at the Newark Museum of Art. I'm Trisha Laughlin Bloom. I am the curator of American art at the Newark Museum of Art. And today we're really very pleased to have with us Kambui Olojimi. Um, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Kambui before we uh, hear from him. And um, I think as people roll in, I might repeat this, but uh, just so that you know, Kambui is going to share some images of his work and talk with his work about um, with us. And afterwards, we will have a question and answer session. You'll be able to post your questions in, if you're on Zoom in the questions comments tab at the bottom of your screen. Or if you're following on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comments section and we'll get those too. So thank you so much for joining us. Kambui Olojimi was born and raised in Bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. His work challenges established modes of thinking that commonly function as inevitabilities. This pursuit takes shape through interdisciplinary bodies of work spanning sculpture, installation, photography, writing, video, and performance. At the Newark Museum, you may have seen Kambui's work in his solo exhibition, Skywriters and Constellations, that was in 2018, or more recently in our historical landscape gallery. Kambui's works have pre premiered nationally and internationally at Sundance Film Festival, Museum of Modern Art, Mass MoCA, Museo Nacional Reina Sofia in Madrid, and Kunsthalle Rotterdam, among many others. Olujimi has been awarded numerous fellowships and residencies, most recently from Black Rock, Senegal. Kambui, thank you so much for being here, taking this time with us today. Thank it's you. To thank have you. you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Tricia. And thank you, Stephen, for helping put this all together. And thank you, Newark Museum, for inviting me. Um, and thank you all for coming out today and sharing your time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the work that I've made in, in regards to memory and commemoration and um, different strategies and different reasons over the course of my practice, my career. And um, hopefully, right now, you know, nationally, we're in a, a we're in two states of crisis. You know, we um, to COVID, we've lost over a hundred thousand people, um, and the, the body count of racism is is unfathomable, and systemic racism is the effects of it are showing up now um, and over and over again. And I think we're in a place where we're trying to remember and commemorate the lives that we lost and the struggles that continue to sort of plague this nation. So this is just some ways in which I toggle between commemorating and remembering site, um, personal, you know, um, personal memories, as well as um, trying to encapsulate historic moment. So I'm going to share some work with you right now. And at the end, there'll be a QA. and um, so we'll be able to share, um, we'll be able to talk. Um, so this, you know, talking about historic moment, um, uh, a little more than a week ago, um, after the death of George Floyd, um, once again, I was really impacted and wasn't able to sleep and I began writing. Following day, um, the third piece in, in Minneapolis was set on fire and this is the, I stayed up all night um, and I really wanted to capture this image because I felt as though even though it was unlike anything I'd seen in my lifetime or at least it was a bit unprecedented in my life, that I knew that history could easily sweep it under the rug. <clears throat> and the same way that there's a, a kind of intentional cultural amnesia to moments like this and to struggles, I felt as, an, as a maker, I wanted to just 
<clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture that moment and that feeling. So um, I, cre I created this one, which is the third, third precinct in Minneapolis, Burns, as well as burnt from, Burns from Afar. <clears throat> and one of the sort of paradoxes of this moment is while these fires are raging, there are fireworks going off. And so it, it spoke to a, a, the dualism of the moment. Um, and part of what I feel like is so key, and I think often when I make work that's in memory of or in commemoration, is that there's so many facets, there's so many angles to one person's life. Like we'll never be able to <clears throat> describe a, a person's life in a movie and a, a work. And so what you're doing is sort of um, picking all of these different points to coalesce and create dialogue over time. So I'm gonna go back a little bit. <clears throat> This is one of the, the first pieces that I did called, um, the first pieces that I'm going to show is called The Proper Burial. Um, in my neighborhood for a long time, I'd done these like suitcase memorials. And when people passed in my neighborhood, I felt weird, but I was always in this place as a photographer <clears throat> to help commemorate, to take, you know, funeral portraits or portraits of the family or when I started making these sculptures. And this is um, the first time I had shown them. And the thing to remember about the, the work is that they all had living plants. And for me, commemoration mm -hmm. as a process, it's not a, a singularity. It's not something that, you know, you just put up and you can walk away from. I wanted this work to be something that every three days or every two days I was showing up in the gallery to water these plants to keep them alive. Um, there's a functionality um, and a, a sort of vernacular space of memorial. Like this is what's in your home. This is like what you have with you every day, with these people and these objects. Uh, <clears throat> so my mother passed in 1998 now, wow. Um, so I've done a number of different things to commemorate Audrey Yvette Washington. And as a kid, I used to forge my mother's name. And so um, I did a piece called Forging Memory in which I basically sat and tried to recreate her signature. And I used to all do this, you know, like I wasn't a bad kid, but I wasn't the best kid. <laughs> and um, I used to sit and forge her name. And one of the things that I loved is she had a really wonderful handwriting and it changed over her life. And part of that, part of what I was doing with this work was finding a way to inhabit that thing that we use to define um, an individual, you know, like when you go and you sign a check or when you sign a contract or when you sign an artwork, it's the thing that, that authenticates, you know, the work that says, this was you. And so to take something like that, um, a symbol like that, and to be able to try and some way recreate um, in a futile way. Um, and this was a project that I continued for a few years. You'll hear me talk more about um, duration or you'll hear me talk a lot about duration. Um, these works develop over, you know, a number of years. Um, so Forging Memory was, I think I started it in maybe like 2005, 2006 or something like that. And it continues into 2009 when I take those signatures. And if you see on the screen, it's embossed. I took the signatures, <clears throat> blew them up, cut them out, and then worked with John Keane when I was doing a BMS residency in Omaha. Um, John Keane is a printmaker um, out at Crichton 
so we worked together to do this blind emboss uh, crank. And so we used paper to work as the plate and there was no ink. And we created these, uh, a 30 foot embossed print that was a series of these signatures over and over one another. Um, you can see a little bit of it on the left. Uh, and so that was another, another sort of place where I wanted to make something that you could barely see, you know, um, that almost was, it was a tactile uh, piece in a lot of ways. Um, and it, as much as it g gave to you, it disappeared. And I think when I, when I encounter memories, that slippage is so important. And it's something that I really try and hold on to in the work that I make. And as we try and grapple and grieve in this moment, there's a feeling like we need to be able to describe all of it, all of the memory, all of the, the person, all of the feelings. It's going to slip through, you know, and it's and that's all right. It's gonna it's gonna morph and turn on you, and, and that's all right. That's part of that's part of what it is to remember, you know. Um, 2005 also, we, we uh, me and a, a dear, dear friend of mine, Hank Willis Thomas, we worked on a, a piece called Winter in America. Um, in 2000, um, his cousin Sunga was, was murdered in Philadelphia. Um, and Sunga was a new friend of mine. And I felt like there was a, a I felt I didn't feel justified in the grief that I had when my, you know, best friend's cousin just was killed. And so, in, in, for for years, I sort of grappled with that, and I made smaller pieces and I made things, and I, and then we started talking about doing Winter in America, and we collaborated on this piece that was a series of photographs and a stop motion animation piece. And I wanted to highlight this work for a number of reasons. Um, it's one of the, you know, one of the works that has traveled the most in both of our careers. But at the same time, this is not something, this commemoration, this memory is not something that we do on our own. It is through community. It is through the, all of the the friends of Sangha that came together to, to help us with animation, to help us get equipment, to, to do voiceovers. <clears throat> it was, you know, to help us write it. So as we look to sort of digest these moments and these emotions, community is something that's so integral. Um, yeah, uh, I think Uh, with Winter in America, something else that was really uh, play, you know, something that was integral was play as tragic as what we were trying to describe. It's through the gesture of play, it's through the action actually of playing that we get to inhabit those memories and those feelings. So we had these GI Joes that we both of us played at, played with as kids. Um, and at the same time, we're critiquing these violent scenarios that we were encouraged to create as kids. Um, these violent scenarios that then play themselves out as adults. Um, and so it was a, a, the making of the work was extremely tumultuous and emotional in part because we go through these different um, sort of arenas of like both our age and, and homecoming. Um, first solo show I ever did was a um, 
It's called Walk the Plank. Um, and it was a conceptual tribute to Nina Simone. Nina Simone is a, one of, if you don't know, one of the greatest singers in the world. And the thing that I always remember about her is that she, you know, her voice is so unapologetic. And she was the bridge in a lot of ways to me and my mother, our different generations. Um, and so when she passed, I would, wanted to do a show that commemorated her life and her work. And this work here in, in, in specific is a series of nameplates, like nameplates that um, have other text on them. And they're four peaches, a mythic character in one of her songs. And this one says, forced to fight the sun. And they're 14 karat gold and platinum. And you see young girls and, and young men in the neighborhood um, with uh, these gold chains and they'll say their name. But as you describe more of yourself, the text actually becomes harder to read. Um, this one says, saving myself for the next great disaster. So existing in a shared mythic space was something that was, for me, something that was like, a, it was a gift. It was something that I always wanted to do. It was like doing a, a time, an, inter, an, an interdimensional like collabor with Nina Simone. With Nina Simone. Um, and yeah, so it was, for me, it was, it was something that, uh, Yeah, and I always remember. This one is always bet on black. Um, so the, I don't know if, if you guys know, but there used to be these dance marathons. And so in the 1920s, uh, into the late 1920s, there were all these like youth culture movements where people would uh, see how long they were all endurance tests, see how long people could sit on a flagpole or how many hot dogs people could eat. And there were all these kinds of contests. So what happens is they start doing these uh, dance marathons and see how long you can dance. Around in the thirties, they realize if people don't do recognizable dances, what they can do is get you know, last longer. So it went from 80 hours <clears throat> to five or six months of perpetual motion. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You ate on the dance floor, you, you know, slept on the dance floor and your partner held you up, got your hair done, you know. And it became a part of perform American performance history that was both grotesque and kind of astounding. Um, it bloomed in the 1930s, so during the Great Depression. And I was most interested in that mythic space, that sort of blade between that like mirror's edge where it's neither, it's both. I don't have it as bad as these, these people. And if they can keep going, I can keep going. So audiences would come and sort of toggle between those two positions. And then it was a, a place for reinvention. But it, the mythic space of this, for a number of reasons, omitted Black people. And so in my research, I was thinking about that vacancy, that vacancy in American mythology and the, the filling it or creating a, a testament to it, as opposed to filling it, but creating a testimony to that and all of those everyday enduring tests that go unnoticed. <clears throat> Perched. Um, so yeah, these are all long exposures and digital collages shot between Brooklyn and Detroit, um, I was working with Young World in Detroit and Brooklyn Academy of Music in, in Brooklyn, New York, um, just to create these, these 
sort of fleeting moments that get elongated. Both cities were having a kind of, I would say, <clears throat> Brooklyn was going through a, a kind of gentrification that was a mass exodus. You know, you have all these New Yorkers leaving the city and it's because of a over attention or a selective attention to the city or commodification of the city in a specific way. And Detroit is having a ton of people from Detroit leaving because of a kind of neglect. And I was looking at the feeling of the two cities and remember in New York, when New York was going through that same, you know, neglect, you know, growing up in the eighties, didn't look too much different where I grew up. And so there was this, to me, this kind of um, uh, interconnectedness. Uh, so, that work was early 2015. And then in 2016, I uh, did a, a show um, at the Q Foundation called Solastalgia. Solastalgia is a, a term coined by Australian philosopher, uh, Glenn Albrecht. And what it is essentially is when you're homesick, but you're still at home, when you're there's a psychic dislocation from where your home, from where you are, you know. Um, he was talking about uh, European farmers on, in Australia. Um, in this exhibition, I wanted to explore it as a New Yorker, um, being a kid from Brooklyn, I felt like the city wasn't my home. And there were three main reasons one was the death of my guardian angel, Catherine Arline. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about Miss Arline. And then rampant gentrification and once again, police killings. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, a work. These are silk screens. They're four by five feet. This is um, the badge of the head of all of all uniform police, Philip Banks, um, when he retired. Um, so I took these images that were circulating on the internet through mass media and drew them over, you know, threw them repeatedly and then uh, manipulated them in scanning. I was interested in how the proliferation of all of these images create a kind of both distancing and numbing. Um, This is the Williamsburg, this is called Ultra Lux. Uh, it's an image of the Williamsburg Savings Bank, um, which at the time was the tallest Brooklyn, the tallest building in Brooklyn. And since then, there have been all these luxury apartments that now eclipse it. <clears throat> but part of what that, that those luxury apartments did was they displaced, you know, thousands of people in downtown Brooklyn and really transformed the, the neighborhood. Um, and so when I was making this work in this exhibition in um, 2015, 2016, the city was in a, was in a, a tumultuous uh, place. Um, Akai Gurley, who um, was just, was shot and killed unarmed in the pink houses, he was just in the projects going down the steps and um, an officer shot him and killed him because he was afraid, because it was dark. There was no confrontation, there was no infraction. Um, and so I wanted, again, to, to sort of make a space to, to have this memory and describe it as both indelible and unforgettable um, and, and put it in, in context with Quan McDaniels in Chicago. And this is a coroner's report. And when I started to think about 
how images of Laquan's um, coroner report was all over the media, all over the internet at the time, the specificity of this state-sponsored violence, the specificity of, of how my people are dying is arbitrary. I did a, an, uh, um, an interview with artist Yeshua Klaus for Modern Painters around police brutality um, um, a number of years ago. And we were talking about um, him being attacked by police. We talked about him being attacked by police and, and he said something, you know, we were talking about how arbitrary it was. And he says, you know, it wasn't like the guy saw my painting and thought this is a horrible painting. It had nothing to do with who he was as an individual, as a, as a thinker um, or as a spirit. It was all about this imagined space that was created in this officer's head, in the society's collective mind. And so for this work, I realized that the specific name, the specifics of the, the, the you know, report are not as key as the fact that this is something that's, it's called, you know, the waiting game. It's like, as long as this is, it's in the mind of America, the names will rotate. This is something that has to be, both has to be addressed, but also the, the sort of wholesale violence as opposed to looking at, oh, this happened with this individual and this happened with this individual. No, this is a design. This is a, a systematic problem. Also in the city at the time, you know, two, I grew up in bed and there were two, two officers that were shot and had in, and killed in retaliation. Um, to one of the many police killings. Um, and there were these funerals and there were images of officers actually embracing, which was something that I had never seen. So in describing this moment, this was also a moment where you have um, at that same funeral, you have the police union turning their back on the mayor. There's um, another Another two officers in my neighborhood get shot. Um, they do not die, but they were both shot in their, um, their vehicles. Um, you have the strike. I don't know if people remember, police stopped arresting. They, they made virtually no arrests um, for almost three weeks and, and in protest. So this was a, a moment that even now when I, tell people about it, it seems like I'm, I'm making it up or like this is a, this is somehow a, a, a fantasy land. Um, that dislocation that I was feeling, that soul nostalgia that I was discussing gets manifested physically in this exhibition as well. Um, because so much of the way we experience the world is spatialized. Um, so much of it is um, tactile. And this piece is called Where From Here. And it's a, a set of um, antique doorknob and door covers in, um, that are set in the corner. Um, so this is a lot of the, of the exhibition. I'm going to talk a little bit about this piece. Um, so these, these pieces of furniture were ratchet strapped directly to the wall um, and just mounted. And in these installations below were kind of reliquary and a moment of um, reflection is the way I was sort of seeing it, um, as well as creating a, um, a second floor. My intention was to create <clears throat> like a second floor that went around the entire back gallery um, where you have furniture from Miss Arlen's um, home 
effectively levitating, creating this space, this sort of in-between space, this uh, liminal space. Uh, just to say a little bit about Miss Arline, Catherine Arline, born in a Husky, North Carolina, moves up to New York City, works for the city of New York for over 40 years, um, evaluating mental health for the Department of Welfare, works for the state, um, works for the city, retires and is a, a pillar, is a pillar of the Bedside community, um, works on, you know, city boards, councils, um, clergy councils all throughout the neighborhood and the city. Um, and then personally just super influential in my life as a guardian, as a, as a, as a, someone to guide me both spiritually. And she just was full of kindness and taught me a lot about what community is and, and how, to, how to help build it. You know, um, well, we'll talk more about Miss All I Know. Um, so this one, mercy doesn't grow on trees. Um, the bottom part of the installation is uh, a glass wishbone that has been snapped and redrawn in the tradition of Japanese pottery. And that, that break is highlighted in gold leaf and it's set a bed of a braided hair, of a really long uh, braid of hair. From time to time I, I use glass in my work um, and I made all of this stuff at Urban Glass in Brooklyn and it was, um, it was an amazing and highly focusing process. Like it was the kind of thing that really sort of, you can't be anywhere else. You can only be focused in that moment. Um, this is key to the city. Um, Ms. Allen really, she, uh, she had everybody's key. She had keys to everybody's apartment pretty much on the block. So when the gas man came, she would let him in. When your car needed to be moved, she would do all of these things in service of the community. Um, and one of the things I remember when I was home working uh, and she needed her key, she'd send me all the way. She lived on top floor or next to top floor. And I would go upstairs and there were these bundles, these fistful of bundles, uh, these bundles, <laughs> these, yeah, these uh, fist-sized bundles of keys. And uh, each one was like a different set of houses. So um, I took those keys and cast them in glass. And then they were set on a, a bed of um, volcanic sand. So every few days I would have to come back and comb the sand and level it out as the air shifted so too with the keys would just shift and move in, on the sand. Um, and again, it's part of that, like the upkeep, the practice of remembering. It's called, this piece is, uh, I knew you before you was born. Um, you know, we we uh, we have people in our lives that are connected to us by blood, and then we have those who um, who have always been there, and um, just honoring those ties uh, to Miss Arline. This is um, glass cane. Um, it was hot sculpted. So I'm going to close out with uh, some works that. On the left side, this is the exhibition at Cure This is Soul Nostalgia, um, curated by Hank Willis Thomas. Um, this is uh, a series of ink drawings on the left. And when Miss Arline died, it was the first time that I wasn't able to inhabit my body um, as an artist. I really, I couldn't photograph. I, I don't usually have writer's block. There was, there was no way for me to access myself and it was terrifying. 
Um, I've been making art since I was a kid. Um, and so I thought to myself, <clears throat> well, if she was alive, what would I do? And I was like, I would go to her <laughs> and, and spend time with her and talk to her. And somehow something would figure itself out. And so I started, I was intrigued by this image of her when she came to New York in 56. Um, and she was 18. And I never met that 18 year old young lady. I was, you know, not born, I was not thought of. And when we go to commemorate, there's whole sections. And my mother used to always say, you know, like I was 40 before you were born. That's a whole life before you, you even come into existence. And so it's it's inevitable that there's a there's all of, all of these pieces, all of these these depths that you don't know about and and don't know about firsthand. Um, it was through spending time with Miss Arlen, I started working in ink. I had not worked in ink before. And for the last five years, I've been creating a project called Walk With Me. And there are meditations on what it is to remember. I use that same uh, photograph from 56 and I've been creating uh, over a hundred ink paintings um, since then as commemoration. And I'll have a, when we get back to, when we open up again, I'll be having a show of all of this work at Project for Empty Space in Newark, New Jersey. And um, yeah, so thank you. And I, I look forward to hearing your questions. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Kimberly, thank you so much. That was a lot, oh, wonderful, <laughs> and a lot, I'm sure, for everybody to take in. Um, we uh, welcome your questions. If you are on Zoom, we have a Q&A button. You can put them there. You can also record your questions on uh, Facebook if you're following us there. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I just want to say again that, um, I mean, your talk raises the what an extraordinary time this is, but that we've been here before and individually and collectively, there's just so much trauma, especially in the African American community. And um, I just think it's so deeply kind of you, you know, to, to share your experiences, your work. Um, I've seen more of your work today. It, it's a lot, Camboy's been working for a while. So this isn't all of it, but this is a great overview. Um, I had a question about um, the, the Minneapolis paintings. Um, is Burns from afar, are there different degrees of, uh, did you intentionally make some of them more abstract than others? Because Burns from afar to me looks really um, kind of universal and harder to pinpoint what you're looking at. Yeah, I think for me, there's a, um... Honestly, when I was making them, this is, this. <laughs> those who know me know, sometimes I describe things and it was like, oh, there you go on that. I was moving through space. Like I, you start in and you have a image, like I was looking at it live happening on Facebook Live. I was um, seeing news reports, but in my mind's eye, I was thinking about what it is to move through the space and to move away from it. So it was almost like, note taking in real time as like my mind was moving through. Um, like I had ones where it's just like small dots in the distance. Um, and is that series ongoing? Are you still working on that series? Yeah, be, you know, being on quarantine and not being in your, your studio, there's a lot of, um, a lot of ways in which you work and to sort of uh, 
capture a moment and hold it. So there's a lot for me to digest and also to digest. There's a lot for me to digest. Um, and I think this is a way to make work, but also to make work that's going to be in conversation with later work or, you know, um, yeah. So yeah, it is ongoing. Yeah, that's the duration part, maybe. Right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, Walk With Me was five years. The dance marathon work I worked on for about seven years, you know, with different projects. So things happen in a, in a cumulative or cyclical, depending on how you sort of, where you stand in, time frame. Okay, we have a couple of comments and questions here. Um, let's start with this one. From Ronnie, thank you for the powerful discussion of the connection of art to remembering and mental health. Um, and this is an anonymous question. As you rework the imagery of your mom, are you ever caught gasping with the image of yourself? Do you see yourself in your mom? Does it? I don't know if they mean okay. images of Miss Arline. I don't know if you mean, um, so Miss Arline, my guardian angel, is different than my mother. And it's funny because you know, uh, yeah, she was, she was, she was in my heart. Um, but yes, I do. Um, I shared some work with uh, an esteemed colleague, um, uh, an amazing artist, Shelly Silva, and she said to me, you know, this is as much a portrait of her as it is of you. You know, this is who you are on, you know, this day in 2016, this is who you are in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. It's a, it's a odd kind of uh, double, like a, a mirrored, a mirrored photo, uh, camera, a mirrored camera that takes a photo of both of us at the same time. Well, it's interesting too, because you said at, when you lost Miss Arline that it, you couldn't inhabit your own body and yeah. you went to her. So it does seem like that there's that really invested, maybe fluid space. Um, interesting. Um, let's see, somebody asked, maybe uh, many of the ink portraits had one blank eye. Is there a reason for that? Or is that a, is that, is there any reason to that? Um. I just think that seeing is not just all sight, you know, like there's, um, there's so much of it that has to do with not seeing. So I don't wanna, I wanted to de-emphasize eyes because we gravitate to them um, in like art history and in, in life. That makes sense. Uh, let's see, um, here's a comment from Alana. Thank you, Kambui. It's so good to hear from you about your beautiful work. I love the recent watercolors. Can you talk more about the way you engage in active maintenance of your pieces, watering plants, et cetera? It seems very unusual in the art world where people often delegate maintenance to gallery staff. It could be considered performance, but audience doesn't seem <laughs> important. Perf well, okay. okay. <laughs> it feels more like ritual of care and process as an aspect of your artistic practice. Spot on. Thank you for the question. It's, um, it is, it is a part ritual. What we do is ritualized work. It's like ritualized labor. It is, um, you know, we, we broker in gesture. We broker in, um, uh, non, you know, non, non-verbal communication and untangible, you know, cachet. Like this is, this is already the language of, of art. Um, and I, you know, I work hard. I work hard doing things like emails and like spell checking. I get to do the watering. I, I, for me, it's not a delegation of labor. As much as I can, I like those kinds of things. I, I want to be able. I feel like I've earned the right to be able to do that, to be able to play in that in those spaces. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I feel like it's a gift um, as much as you know possible. Um, as much as I do it, as much as possible, and then um, yeah, this. I don't know if it is performative, because I think. Um, 
I, I would say it's more ritualistic. Okay, um, we have more questions here, Maurice asks, when expressing pain, do certain levels come out better based on which of the art forms you've chosen as the vessel? I noticed you have mastered several art forms or ways of expression. Thank you, thank you. The, the figuring it out is a, a game of listening that sometimes I think I do better than at other times. Um, and the pro to me, the projects will reveal what they want and then you can figure out how to get it. You know, sometimes it's something that is definitely in my wheelhouse. I know how to do it. Sometimes I have to go, um, what I haven't talked about is a lot of times I go and learn how to do specific, uh, you know, things like, you know, work with people at Urban Glass to learn how to sculpt glass, take classes. And sometimes it's within your hand and sometimes it's working with someone. Um, but yeah, I really love the figuring out, um, figuring out what 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 the work needs first. Great question and answer. Um, let's see. Uh, other question is um, from Kelly. Who says uh, you said you have been creating since you art since you were a child? Was there a teacher or a person who encouraged you in your art when you were young? Yeah, so I love shout outs. You messed up, Kelly. <laughs> I love shout outs. Um, um, I would say I'm gonna start with my mom, Audrey Vet Washington, who we made collages. When, when I was a kid, when I was like so little, I was like, I get scissors, that kind of <laughs> um, uh, Romeo Bearden, who I thought was a superhero for uh, the better part of my single digits, and like when I was like five, six, seven, eight. Um, Miss Mahandrew, my first grade teacher, who was just like an amazing, I, I, like she was Wiki, Wikipedia before there was Wikipedia and was mm -hmm. always down to like share stuff. And then, you know, it continues, uh, I think, you know, people like Larry Fink and Charles Kelton, Deborah Willis and um, Chester Higgins. You know, I came up through photography. I came up through poetry. So people, you know, like um, M.A. Cezaire and, um, you know, the Darkroom Collective. I, I, I didn't talk about it, but I came up, you know, I studied poetry. And the Darkroom Collective is a collection of, um, or a, a writing troupe of amazing um, black poets who have won like Pulitzers and Nobel Prize, but like they were in their twenties and I was, you know, a, a young punk hanging out with them. So them and they influenced me in arts and uh, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying not to, to just go on the long list, but, um, and then people like um, uh, Kerry James Marshall, you know, and, and Hammonds who, and then they, and that's excluding all the peers that continue to influence me, you know? So yeah, if you, if you want, I give you a list, like a full list, like hundred names. <laughs> yeah, I like that you started with your mother though. Let's that plants us in, in, a, in a space and time, young, young convoy. Um, this is a good question. Um, with the concept of duration in your work, how do you know when a project is over or an idea or thought is complete? Mm -hmm. Or are each of these projects always open-ended? You know, I, I feel like, Truth, the truth is like you get, whether or not you say it's finished, it's finished until you start working on it again, you know? And there are things that I walk away from and I'm like, I think this is done. Well, I think this needs to be done. Like I, I need to be done with this work, um, wherever it, it lies. Um, I think it was Elizabeth Price who was talking about how, you know, amazing artists, uh, China Prize winner, she, go in and rework a, a piece in the museum. And <laughs> I feel like the bounds of completion are not described by exhibition. 
So you can exhibit something and change it. Um, I think it's not a lot of fun for historians and registrars, but the work itself, um, that's, that's what takes the lead. Uh, so that's interesting also in um, just to comment on uh, the work that you, you commissioned from you, um, Skywriters and Skywriters, right? It yeah. was a new media piece for the uh, planetarium, the planetarium and it was very evolving. The, the creation process was long and it was part of the, the Wayward North series, which you had begun in 2010. Mm -hmm. And um, I attached to that, you might not agree with this. We have never actually talked about this, I think. Mm -hmm. I attached with this sense of like, uh, it had this epic quality, like uh, the way that uh, some there's different versions of what happened in the Bible or uh -huh. the Odyssey, there's more than one version. The fact that we couldn't fix an exact narrative, there are pieces of the narrative in the planetarium, there are pieces of the narrative in your book. And then again, in the imagery that you created around that. So it's my observation. Um, well, something that when you have a mythology, you have the different versions and you have um, parts of it that get uh, sort of highlighted and they conflict or, you know, that's how you get a rich narrative space. You know, um, it's the lithographs, it's the complete narrative in the book, it's the artifacts from the art, uh, art in general exhibition. It's the planetarium um, animation uh, full dome projection. Like all of those things build this world. And that's even before you get to what viewers bring to it and decide to omit or add. Yeah. Um, we have, um, let's see, a couple other questions here. Um, let's see, uh, any thoughts, this is a big one, any thoughts on the controversy surrounding Confederate monuments, memorials, and names of places? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really find it to, I don't think that it should be controversial. Um, there's no other place in the world where there are monuments, uh, let me know if there's a place in the world where you lose a war and then in the country, that one, you erect monuments. Yeah, I think it's a large conversation. <laughs> um, um, you know, this, I think it's past due. I think it's so past due that it's, um, that I, I I'm, I'm kind of like, you, I don't, I can't applaud finally waking up. You know, I think it's, it's way overdoing this actually. Like, I'm like, respect the actual, if you can't, or it's the same people that are doing respect the flag, respect the flag, <laughs> you know? Don't honor racist people who look to tear apart the country that you pledge of allegiance to. Like, it's not only contradictory, it's like bad ideology. It's like, it's poo on every level. Um, what I will say is that it, it makes me think of um, how monuments um, are atemporal, like there's the idea that those values are atemporal, but are monuments in the way that they're constructed in the West, something that it's not inevitable that a monument would fall because of how it excludes the breathing of a community, like the, the conversation and the, its own idea of like a sealed um, importance and a, a rigidity. Like, does that not make it um, inevitable that they'll come down all monuments that are constructed in this sort of mon modernist context? Well, they're created in a moment in time and we know that things change. And to that, and I think that like uh, the phenomenon at the Vietnam Memorial where I think that might be the first place where people started leaving um, at an official monument where people started leaving things and they had to clear them away so people could leave more things in memory of their loved ones. And now there's a whole warehouse somewhere in the Washington area that's keeping because they become part of the monument when you leave them there. So I think 
yeah, big topic on monuments, but it's a nice way to tie in with everything here memory and commemoration. And I'm afraid that we're gonna have to stop there. Uh, really wonderful conversation. And we are so appreciative, Kambui. Um, uh, we hope if you uh, can that you will join us next week on Thursday, Thursday the 18th. We have another Lunch and Learn at Science Week. So we're gonna have a really interesting um, conversation about the science behind art from a conservator's point of view. Um, thank you everybody so much. We look forward to seeing you again soon in the real world and on Zoom, Kambui. Yeah, and reach out to me if you were too shy to ask your question or you think of a question later. It's just my name, first name, Kambui Ojimi on Instagram and the same .com and my website. I, I'm, I love meeting artists and thinkers, so just I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Take care. <laughs>